In this lecture, we are going to learn about REST architecture, which is the most popular architecture used for building web APIs. REST stands for Representational State Transfer and it is basically a way of building web APIs in a logical way, making them easy to consume. Remember that when we build an API, it can be consumed by us or it can also be consumed by others. For that, we need to make the process of consuming the APIs as smooth as possible for the users. Now, to build RESTful APIs, that is the APIs which follows the REST architecture, we just need to follow a few principles which every REST API should adhere to. First, we need to separate our API into logical resources. The key abstraction of the information in REST is a resource and therefore all the data that we want to share through the API should be divided into logical resources. A resource is basically an object or a representation of something which has some data associated to it. For example, movies, users, reviews, etc. In simple terms, any information that can be named can be a resource. But keep in mind, it has to be a name, it has to be a noun and not a verb like get user, get movies, delete user, etc. These resources should then be exposed. That means they should be made available using structured resource based URL that the client can send requests to. For example, here we have a web address. Now this entire address is called as a URL and in that address this add movie is called as API endpoint. So an API can have many different endpoints like get movies, get users, add movies, delete movies, get reviews etc. And each of these endpoints will send different data back to the client or perform different actions. For example, this get movies endpoint, it will get all the movies and it will return it to the user. In the same way, this update movies endpoint will update a movie. This delete movies endpoint, it will delete a movie. Okay, so an endpoint can perform different actions and it can also send different data. For example, get movies endpoint will send a list of movies to the client. In the same way, get user endpoint will send a list of users to the client. Now, there's something very wrong with these endpoints here because as we learned in the first principle, Endpoint should only contain a name, it should contain a noun and not a verb. And if you notice, all these endpoints contains a verb. For example, get movies, update movies, delete movies. So all of these endpoints are actually verbs. So to perform different actions like reading, adding, updating, deleting, etc. The API should use the right HTTP methods and not the endpoints with verb in it. So endpoint should only contain resource and not the action that can be performed on them because that will quickly become a nightmare to maintain. So how should we use these HTTP methods in practice? Let's take an example of this get movies endpoint. This get movies endpoint is about getting data related to all the movies. So we should simply name the endpoint as movies and send the data whenever a get request is made to this endpoint. Here if you notice. In the resource, we don't have a verb, we have a noun and we are also using an HTTP method. So in simple words, when a client makes a GET request to this endpoint, we send data related to all the movies in the response. And just like this, we only have resource in the endpoint or in the URL and no verbs because the verb is now in the HTTP method, right? Also remember that it is a common practice to use the resource name in plural, which is why I called it as movies and not movie. Now the convention is that when calling that endpoint, we get back all the movies that is in the database. But if we want only one movie data with a specific ID, let's say 21, then we add that 21 after another slash or we can also use search query or we can also use name of the movie instead of the ID. Okay, or we can use some other unique identifiers based on the requirement. Now here in this example, when I make a get request to this URL, to this endpoint, then it is going to return us a movie with this ID 21. Okay, so keep in mind that the get HTTP verb is used to perform read operation on the data. If the client want to create a new resource in the database, for example, if the client wants to create a new movie, then the post HTTP verb should be used. A POST request can be used to send data to the server. That's why we can use POST method to create a new resource. Now in case of POST request, usually no ID should be sent with the data because the server should automatically figure out the new ID for the newly added resources. Okay. And if you notice, 
The endpoint name is exactly same for reading movies data as well as creating movies data. The only difference is the HTTP method that is used for the request. So if this slash movies endpoint is accessed with a get request, we send data to the client. But if the same slash movies resource is accessed with a post request, we expect data to come in with the request so that we can create a new resource on the server side. Now we should also be able to update the resource. For that, we can either use put or patch HTTP request from the client. The difference is that with put request, the client is supposed to send entire updated object. But with patch, it is only supposed to send only the part of the object that has been changed. But both of them have the ability to send the data to the server. It's a bit like post request, but with a different intent. Post is used to create a new resource, but with put or patch, we can update an existing resource. Finally, to delete a resource, we have HTTP delete method. In case of delete, the ID or some other unique identifier should be the part of the URL. So these are the five HTTP methods that we can respond to when building a RESTful API so that the client can perform four basic CRUD operations. CRUD stands for create, read, update and delete. And you will see this term all the time related to APIs and databases. Now there might be actions that are not related to CRUD. And in that case, we just need to be creative with our endpoint. For example, a login or search operation. These operations are not really related to any particular resource and they are not CRUD operations either. But we can still create endpoints for them. For example, we can create an endpoint like slash login or slash search. And we will talk about more about these cases in the future lectures of this course. Now, let's say we want to create an endpoint where we want to get all the movies a user has rented. For that, we can create an API something like this. So we can create an endpoint slash users slash the user ID for which we want to get all the movies which he has rented slash movies. Okay. And on that, we can make a get request. Or if you want to delete a rented movie from a particular user, in that case, we can create an endpoint something like this. So here we are telling for the user number 23 who has rented a movie with the ID 16, we want to delete that movie for that user. I hope it makes sense here. So this is how we use HTTP methods to build user friendly and nicely structured URLs. They are easy and logical to consume for the clients. Now, whenever we make a request to the client, no matter we are making a get request, post request, put request, patch request or delete request, the data that we send back to the client in the response body or the data that we receive from the client in the request body, it should usually use the JSON data format with some formatting standard applied to it. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation and it is a very lightweight data interchange format which is heavily used by web APIs coded in any programming language. Now we can send the data which we receive from the data source in the JSON format as it is. But we usually do some simple response formatting before sending it to the client. And there are a couple of standards for this and we are going to use a very simple one called JSON JSON data format. In the JSON JSON data format, we simply create an object with a status property which can be set to success, fail or error, informing the client whether the request was successful, it failed or an error occurred. And then we also create a data property and to that we assign our original data which we want to send in the response. Now we can also add a couple of more properties but this is really the simplest way of formatting the response. So in the left hand side, we have the actual JSON data which we want to send in the response. And in the right hand side, we have the formatted JSON data which we are actually sending in the response. And here we are applying the JSON JSON formatting. So in the JSON JSON formatting, we are wrapping the original data into another object. And this is called as enveloping. It's a common practice to mitigate some security issues and other problems. Also, there are other standards for response formatting that you can look into, for example, JSON API or OData JSON protocol. Finally, another important principle of REST API is that they must be stateless. Now, what do you mean by stateless? In a stateless RESTful API, all state is handled on the client and not on the server. For example, whether a certain user is logged in or not, or what is the current page the user is on out of a list of several pages. Now, the fact that the state should be handled on the client means that each request must contain all the information that is necessary to process a certain request on the server.
So the server should never have to remember the previous request in order to process the current request. So let's say we have a list with several pages. For example, let's say we are currently on the page 3 and we want to move to the next page that is page 4. So here the current page is page 3. Now in order to move to the next page that is page 4, we can have a simple endpoint called slash movie slash next page and when we make a get request to this endpoint, the web API should return us page 4. But here the problem is the server will have to figure out what the current page is and based on that send the next page to the client. In other words, the server would have to remember the previous request. It will have to handle the state on the server side. And that is exactly what we want to avoid in RESTful APIs. And to avoid that, instead of creating an endpoint like slash movies slash next page, we should create an endpoint like slash movies slash page slash 4, where we can also specify the page number which we are requesting. So here, this last part of this endpoint, this 4, it is specifying which page we are requesting for. In this way, we are handling state on the client because on the client, we would already know that we are on the page 3. So all we have to do is add 1 to the current page and request next page, that is the page 4. So the server does not have to remember anything in this case. All it has to do is, it has to send the data for the page number 4 as we requested. And this is what stateless means. And that's all I wanted to cover about REST architecture and its principles in this lecture. I hope now you have an understanding of what rules an API should follow in order to be called as RESTful API. In the next lecture, let's go ahead and create our very first API. This is all from this lecture. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask it. Thank you for listening and have a great day.